On March 7th of 1993, I read a story in the newspaper that I had no idea was going to have such a profound impact on my life. After all, at that time, I was working at Atlantic Records, so my area of expertise was the music industry, a far cry from prisons or justice or mandatory sentencing laws. I myself had not had any negative interaction with law enforcement, and there's a good reason for that, which is that I grew up in a world of privilege. My father, after all, was Joe Flom, the legendary attorney and founder and leader of the powerhouse law firm Skadden Arps, Slate Mar and Flom, also known as Skadden, that he built into one of the biggest law firms in the world. Now, a little context about my dad. My dad was the son of Russian immigrants who spoke no English, and they were so poor that when he grew up in Brooklyn, just him, his parents, and his sister Flo, yes, her name was Flo Flom. Um, like I said, they didn't speak English. So they were so poor that in those days in Brooklyn, the landlords would often give you the first month's rent for free just to convince you to move into their properties. And so they moved every month because they just didn't have any money to pay. They were like nomads in New York. And so dad went to City College at night, worked during the day, he slept on the subway, existed on a diet of chocolate donuts and coffee because that's what he could afford. And he never graduated college because World War II started. So he joined the army. When he got out of the army, he wrote a letter to Harvard Law School, considered by many the greatest law school in the world. And he said, I don't have any money, and I don't have a college degree, but I'm the best thing since sliced bread. And if you let me in, you won't regret it. Well, they gave him a full scholarship, and he went on to become one of the greatest legal minds of the 20th century. So my dad was my hero and my mentor, and I learned so much from him. But I'll never forget one thing he told me. He sat me down one day, he said, son, do whatever you want to do. Try to be the best at it. But just remember, the most important thing is to make the world a better place. If you do that, you'll be a success in my eyes. Well, I very much wanted to be a success in his eyes. But that being said, I was a wild, rebellious kid who always had a joint in my mouth. And I had so much hair that it's a miracle that I actually didn't set myself on fire. Um, yes, that was me. I had so much hair that in the summer, as you can see, I only had a tiny slot in the front to see through. So in order to look this way, I had to turn this way and look through the hole and past my nose, which is big. And then to look this way, I turned this way. <clears throat> so obviously, I was very practically blind. And so, through this helmet of smoke and hair, and one day, the inevitable happened. I bumped into a police officer while I was smoking a joint. Now, the good news for me was in the neighborhood I grew up in, the police were less likely to rough you up. And so he just told me in a, in a rough voice, put that out, and I threw it away. But I knew very well that had I been from the poor side of town or had my skin been a different color, I would have been thrown up against the wall, handcuffed, and arrested, just as hundreds of thousands of people were then, and they still are today in America. So I had sort of a there but for the grace of God go I moment. I'm not a particularly religious person, but I could easily see how another person in the same situation could be so negatively impacted. And I knew then that I could have gotten myself arrested or, or you know, in some sort of issues, but what I didn't know until I read that story in the newspaper was how much real trouble I could have gotten in. So one day, it's just a regular Saturday. I was on my way to play tennis or something, and I wanted something to read in the taxi. So I stopped at a newsstand. I bought a newspaper, the New York Post. Well, that wasn't the taper, paper that I typically read, but apparently it was the paper I was meant to read. Serendipity and synchronicity are a big part of my story, and this was no exception. So the headline caught my attention. Ferraro's plea for cocaine kid. This was a story about a kid named Stephen Lennon. He was the same age as I was, 32, so it really hit me. And he was serving a sentence, of, a mandatory sentence of 15 years to life in a maximum security prison for a nonviolent first offense cocaine possession charge. 
Now, I know that sounds crazy because it sounds crazy to me even though I'm saying it. So let me repeat that. Uh, 15 years minimum for a nonviolent first offense cocaine possession charge. I had no idea that these type of sentences even existed. And I said, I have, to, I have to do something. So rather than turn the page, I went to the phone book. Does anybody remember phone books? They used to be at the... <laughs> so I went to the phone book, and I looked up the phone number of his mother, who was listed in the article. Now, the reason the article was in the newspaper at all was because, even though it was a typical sentence, Mrs. Lennon was a typical type of woman. She had gotten letters written to the governor in hopes of getting her son clemency. Governor Mario Cuomo was the only person that could grant clemency in a situation like this. And she had letters written from the judge, the sentencing judge, the warden, even Geraldine Ferraro, who at that time was the first woman ever to be nominated to be vice president of the United States from a major political party. So Mrs. Lennon, from her humble background, had accomplished all these things, but the governor had said no. We're not going to free him. So I spoke to Mrs. Lennon and I said, listen, you probably think I'm some weirdo from New York City calling you out of the blue, but I just read this story. I'm freaking out. I have to do something. Can I send you a little bit of money? I don't have a lot of money. I'll send you what I can. Maybe you can get a new lawyer. She said, well, we've exhausted all of our appeals. This was our last hope. And she said, I, I, I don't understand. And I said, I don't understand it either. He'd been in for eight years already. And I was thinking about my life and his life and how the, you know, how, how the randomness of the, of the different fates. And so I said, I'm going to see what I can do. So I called the only criminal defense lawyer I knew, a guy named Bob Kalina. Now, I knew Bob because at that time I had two artists that I had signed named Skid Row and Stone Temple Pilots. And the singers were getting arrested like twice a week. So I had Bob on speed dial. So I called Bob. I said, Bob, is there anything you can do? He said, listen, there's nothing you can do. These cases happen all the time. There's thousands of guys like him in New York state prisons. I said, do me a favor. Talk to Shirley on the phone. He talked to her. He calls me up a while later. He says, listen, I have an idea. It won't work, but as a favor to you, I'll take the case pro bono. Five months later, we ended up in a courtroom in Malone, New York, right on the Canadian border. And I sat there holding Mrs. Lennon's hand with her husband Stan on the other side as they brought her son in in shackles. The prosecution made their argument. Bob made the argument for our side. The judge didn't give me a lot of confidence. He looked like Colonel Sanders. He had white hair. He looked like a very conservative guy. I thought he's never going to give us a, a break here, you know. But he said something after the arguments were made. He said, I had to section this, statute that. I didn't know what he was talking about. Under the power vested in me, the motion is granted. And he slams the gavel down. And Bob comes rushing over. I said, Bob, what happened? He said, we won. I said, we won? That's incredible. It was literally the best feeling I had ever had. <clears throat> That picture, my hair was a little bit shorter. Um, still, my barber was confused, but uh, that was taken outside the courtroom, Bob on the left and the, uh, the Lennons in the middle as Stephen was about to be freed. Six months later, I got a letter in the mail from a woman whose name I didn't recognize. Her name was Joanne Paris from Cincinnati, Ohio. I opened the letter and the first line really got my attention. It said, Dear Jason, you don't know me, but you got me pregnant. <laughs> now, I see a couple of nervous men out there. Um, that's not something that any of us men ever want to hear. I'm thinking, did I go to Cincinnati uh, nine months ago? What's going on here? So I kept on reading, and it went on to say, I'm the sister of Stephen Lennon, and for the past five years, my husband and I have been trying to conceive, and the doctor told me that the stress of my brother's incarceration has prevented me from getting pregnant. Well, now I'm three months pregnant. I just thought you would want to know. So that was another moment um, that I'll never forget. So I did some research. I found out about an organization called Families Against Mandatory Minimums, which had just started with the goal of abolishing these mandatory sentencing laws. That led me to the Drug Policy Alliance, which leads the, what I call the war against the war on drugs, where they're trying to, to get a sensible drug policy that will 
you know, prevent people from ending up in the system and put them into treatment instead, among other things. I myself had gone to rehab by this point, because in America, if you're lucky and if you're well-to-do um, and you manage to avoid being arrested, they send you to rehab. So I've been, I haven't had a drug or anything for I don't know how many decades now. I'm old. So anyway, <clears throat> the next eureka moment came when I was at my in-law's house. And I was just flipping the channels, because I was bored, looking for something to do. And I saw a story on TV about a guy named David Keaton. David Keaton had been sentenced to death and was scheduled to be executed within weeks when a new organization called the Innocence Project came along and discovered the DNA from the crime scene and proved that he could not have been the perpetrator. And he was, not only was he not executed, he was freed. And I thought, that is the craziest thing I've ever heard. It didn't occur to me until then that so often in America and all over the world, innocent people are locked up for years, decades, life, or even sentenced to death as David had been. So I called the Innocence Project. At that time, you could get one of the founders on the phone because nobody else was working there. And it was just those guys. So I went in to meet with them. It was just two guys in a small room with a briefcase and a dream. Barry Sheck and Peter Neufeld. I said, I'm in. Whatever you need, you got me. So I became the founding board member of the Innocence Project. And now, hundreds of exonerations, dozens of legislative reforms later, we're just getting started. Um, we would love to be put out of business because, you know, that would be the best possible outcome, but unfortunately, it's not going to happen in our lifetimes. There's just too many innocent people. So, I've been thrilled to be associated with these wonderful organizations as well as others for 25 years now, but along the way, I became obsessed with what I call the second punishment. And what I mean by that is, the challenges and obstacles that people face, innocent or guilty, when they're released from prison and they don't know where to turn. They can't get a job. People look at them like they're somehow tainted, that they're lesser than we are. Um, it's difficult to get uh, housing. There's so many restrictions. Uh, to Even to get a driver's license or a suit or to write a resume. It's all so difficult when you've been in prison for decades. So I started a program called the Life After Exoneration Program to help with the, you know, the, the re-entry into society. And I've, I've co-founded something called the Innocence Network Conference, which is a gathering of hundreds of exonerees from all over the country and the world with social workers, activists, and lawyers where they learn from each other. And it's a powerful, powerful event. So this work led me to start my podcast wrongful conviction. On wrongful conviction, I interview men and women who have been in prison for decades for crimes they didn't commit. Some were even sentenced to death. Sometimes I go inside prisons to talk to people who I have evidence of innocence that I want to get the word out. And it's been such an extraordinary experience because just being around people like Pete, Susan, and all the wonderful exonerees that I've had the privilege to know, it gives me gratitude in my attitude. And a typical, it's amazing because so many people ask me, aren't they, anyone who I meet, I'm talking about the Innocence Project because I'm always preaching about it. They say, well, aren't they bitter? I haven't met, I haven't met one yet who has, they have this sort of state of grace that they exist in. And, and one example is a guy named Keith Allen Harward. Keith was a guy was convicted of a, he was on my podcast, Keith Allen Harbor was a guy who was convicted of a brutal crime. It was a home invasion in Virginia where the husband was killed, the wife was raped and tortured for hours, and they couldn't find the perpetrator. So there was a lot of pressure on the police. And even though Keith had no prior record, he came in their crosshairs and he presented a convenient scapegoat, so they framed him. He now avoided the death penalty, he was sentenced to life, and he served 33 years in prison before he was proven with DNA to be an innocent man and was released. And Keith was on my podcast. I said, Keith, how did you survive in prison? How did you maintain hope? How does that even work? 
and he says to me, and he's from North Carolina, so he has a southern accent, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mess it up, but I'm going to try to do his accent for you now. So he says to me, listen, man, he says, you know, uh, I was innocent, so that helped. And I was like, that helped? That wouldn't have helped me. That would have made me even crazier knowing that I'm innocent in here the whole time. And he says, well, Jason, I got to tell you something, man. He says, uh, you know, when I went to prison, I said to myself, you know what? Uh, they took my body and they took my freedom, but I'm not going to let them take my mind. Because if I do that, I'm letting them win. <laughs> and I said to myself, this is a guy who really has touched on the meaning of life. And it felt, I felt as if I was in, as close as I'm ever gonna get to being in the presence of someone like Nelson Mandela. So the first time I met Keith was a few weeks after he was released in 2015. At the offices of the Innocence Project, I saw him in the hallway with Peter Neufeld, that same guy that I had sat in that little office with over two decades earlier. Peter says, Jason, come with us. And they took me inside a supply room. I thought, why are we going in the supply room? And he says to me, he says to Keith, Keith, show him your tattoo. After I recovered my senses, I took this photograph and it really struck me because until I saw that tattoo, I had no idea that my dad's law firm had represented Keith pro bono for over a decade alongside the lawyers of the Innocence Project, and that had led to his release. So, at that point, everything really came full circle for me. I only wish that my dad had been alive to see it because he would have been so happy. In closing, I have a saying. I've seen too many miracles to stop believing in miracles. I've been involved in so many incredible stories from all different types of people, amazing recoveries, amazing second chances. And it just makes me think, you know, I've learned that everyone has the ability to affect an outcome. And so, what I hope is that just once this year, let's take an action that we wouldn't otherwise have taken. Let's, let's, let's correct an injustice. Let's stand up for someone who can't stand up for themselves. The next time we see a story in the newspaper or on the TV, rather than turn that page, let's do something to try to get that person justice that they deserve. I believe that if we do that, we will not only transform society, we can transform ourselves. Thank you very much.